My name is Dr. Rizwan Qureshi and today I am back with another interesting case. I received a bad call about a 55 year old gentleman who was brought in by ambulance in extreme respiratory distress. So the initial information was that this 55 year old male is in severe respiratory distress. He's been coughing for about two weeks. He's got reduced to almost no air entry on the right lung and he's also complaining of severe excruciating right sided chest pain. The initial set of OBS showed that he's got a saturation of 60% and when they put a non-rebreather mask on, they would only improve to 80%. He had a blood pressure of 160 by 100, tachycardic 120, he was afebrile and was fully conscious. The ambulance said that they are going to arrive to us in five minutes time. Hit pause and think about how you're going to resuscitate this patient. What are your immediate management priorities? Well, my management priorities were that this patient needs intubation straight away. But before I intubate this patient, I need to optimize his condition. As we know, whenever we're resuscitating someone who is in um, severe respiratory distress, those patients prefer to tripod. They like to sit forward. Um, and this patient, as opposed to tripoding or sitting up, wanted to lie down. He said that I cannot breathe sitting up and he would follow a very typical pattern. He would get this extreme right-sided chest pain. He would just say that I cannot breathe, make me lie down. In his SATs, which I've now achieved to be in the mid 90s range, would then rapidly desaturate, despite the fact that he's on oxygen, down to mid 60s. What do you think that might be going on with this patient? Any patient with a chest pain, you tend to think of acute coronary syndrome. We did the ECG, which showed just a sinus tachycardia, but no ischemia. You also think of pulmonary embolism, so prophylactically I give patient 1.5 milligram per kilogram of clexane. Also with the chest pain and shortness of breath, right pneumothorax was on top of the list, but there were no features of right pneumothorax on bedside ultrasound. But then again, the challenging situation was that he would still desaturate to mid 70s down to mid 60s. So my plan is was uh, use a video laryngoscope or CMAC uh, using a size 8 tube through the bougie and then securing the tube. That was my plan A. Plan B was uh, that if we are unable to intubate this patient, come out if he's rapidly desaturating, we're going to put a laryngeal mask and airway or LMA or eye gel, whatever you use in your department, and then we're going to build up the SATs again to reintubate improving our strategy in terms of patient propping up, uh, perhaps uh, um, tube with an introducer. And if we still could not intubate this patient with renewed strategy, the plan C would be to have front of the neck axis, which is a scalpel, bougie, and tube. I was team leading, so I was not intubating uh, this patient. There was another doctor who was intubating this patient as a team leader, and my job was to give drugs and go through the checklist, uh, which was a COVID intubation checklist. So I give the patient 200 milligrams of ketamine, 150 milligrams of rocuronium. We set one minute time clock, and after about one minute had passed, uh, I got that senior registrar to have a look. As he passed the video laryngoscope, it was very clear that he had a beautiful looking grade one video laryngoscope view. But as he was trying to pass down the bougie, the bougie would just not go through the cords. His larynx, the patient's larynx was quite high up interior. So immediately I thought, okay, fine, this patient may need some laryngeal manipulation. So we, um, I pressed the larynx backward um, and he tried again to pass the bougie and it did not happen. We were not able, he was not able to pass um, the bougie, let alone the tube. He tried to pass the tube directly, maybe because it's a bit more firm at the distal tip compared to bougie and a bit more control in hand, and he was unable to pass the tube either. Uh, I took over from him within the same induction and paralysis, and I also tried to pass the bougie it was just not happening. One of the things which I could understand with the high up anterior larynx, he 
had a small, relatively small mouth opening and the patient had actually started to desaturate at that point so we thought okay we'll come out. At that point we just put the LMA in, bag valve masked him, we improved his oxygen saturation to about nearly 100%. I chose to reinduce and re-paralyze him just because I wanted my second attempt to be ideal. Uh, this time around with the improved positioning of the patient, I was just able to pass the tip of the uh, tip of the bougie through the cords and was able to railroad the tube and hence we finally secured the tube. Uh, the patient was not hypoxic and we were able to maintain the SATs without any major drama. We secured the tube, uh, we got the post-intubation x-ray um, and uh, the post-intubation x-ray showed basically a complete collapse of the right side of the lung uh, while the left side looked more hyperinflated but there was no underlying pneumothorax. So on, um, on the back of my mind there was a presumption that this patient may have a pulmonary embolism even though I've given him clexane I want to get a CTPA done or CT pulmonary angiogram done to see what's happening down in his lung. This sort of lung collapse looks very unusual. So now that we've had the secured airway in, um, I was more than happy to take him to the CT scanner. I was actually now talking to the retrieval specialist to have him shipped over across to a tertiary hospital because this hospital where I was working, there was no intensive care unit, as I said. Um, and the nurses actually gained my attention that Rizwan, uh, this patient is desaturating again. Whenever you get a post-intubation patient desaturating, you think about all the way from the wall to the ventilator to the patient circuits. Monic that I find most useful for post-intubation hypoxia is DOPES. Defib displacement, so I put in a laryngoscope and had a look at the tube. The tube was still nicely secured, passing through the cords. Obstructions, so checked all the uh, tubing from the wall to the ventilator and from the ventilator to the patient. There was no kinking, there was no obstruction. Also checking the tube, we suctioned down the tube. Uh, through the suction catheter and there was no increased respiratory secretions that might be blocking the tube and causing hypoxia. P stands for pneumothorax, repeated the bedside ultrasound. In fact, we also repeated now the mobile chest x-ray and there was no pneumothorax post intubation and post mechanical ventilation. Our ventilator in terms of equipment, our ventilator and all the connecting tubes were working fine. There were no alarms. We checked the settings on the ventilator again literally rolled my hands through all the tubings from the wall to the ventilator from the ventilator to the patient making sure nothing is kinked clamped or obstructed in any way last i was thinking about could it be stacked breaths but often the patients in my experience who have an auto peep like asthmatics and copd with stacked breathing breathing tend to become hypotensive first before the hypoxia so that um, did not cross my mind. You could see on the monitor his desaturation were from 90 to 80 percent all the way to down to 70 percent and that was unusual. So I disconnected the patient from the ventilator, uh, connected him to the bag valve mask through the viral filter and just start to bag him. His saturation were not completely coming up nicely as you'd expect um, so we gave him paralysis with further rocuronium dose of 50 milligrams. His saturation did improve again a little bit, um, but they were not as close to normal as 100% that we previously had. He, the CT scan of the chest uh, uh, basically was showing that he had a right-sided, had a hilar mass which was extending into the right main bronchus. So you can see here in the CT scan, the red circle shows the distal end of the intratracheal tube just above the level of the carina. As we go down you can see that uh, the, the main trachea is divided into the two sides the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. The right is shown by the red arrow and it shows that it's narrow compared to the left which is green arrow which is wider. And now in this last picture, you can see that right main bronchus is completely surrounded by the tumor and it's completely obstructed, while the left main bronchus, which is shown by the green arrow, still has got patency and the left lung also looks larger. We now knew that we're dealing with a second type of evil, which is that he's got a right big obstructive hilar mass, which pretty much encompasses his right main um, bronchus.
yeah. it was i think at that point in the hindsight bit of tube migration distally impinging on and hence distally blocking the endotracheal tube by the way which did improve the saturation to mid 90s by uh, lying down the patient the patient started to go hypoxic again and this time i was really worried that we have troubleshooted the tube migration or impinging into the tumor we've paralyzed him um, in fact one thing i forgot to mention um, is that we even got him on ketamine sedation so i was quickly running out of options as to what would my next step be um, and uh, the patient w was just desaturating right before our eyes with the FiO2 of 100% with a peep of actually which was raised from 5 to 10. Again, we repeated all our cycle from the connections, the equipment, the dopes protocol and nothing seems to have worked. Listening to his chest, he had an ongoing reduced air entry onto the right side but we already knew that, that he has got a collapsed lung. He's got a very small lung to be ventilated on the right side. As you can see on the CT scan too, his left lung seems to be hyperinflated. In fact, you can see the trachea to be shifted onto the right side because of the left lung hyperexpansion. And uh, one of the ways to uh, use this to my advantage would be to lift endobronchially intubate and ventilate him, meaning that withdraw the tube, twist it, and somehow get it into the left main bronchus to just preferentially ventilate the left lung we went and checked the tube position which was still uh, going through the cords um, I then untied the tube and withdraw the tube uh, so I thought maybe it's still impinging a little bit onto that cancer um, I withdrew the tube and tried to orient it a bit more onto the leftward direction preferentially now the airflow is through the left lung as opposed to the right lung and that just immediately improved the saturation about 70 percent and that took the saturation entirely out to about 90 percent 95 percent and almost 100 percent so what happened now that nurse called me again half an hour later the patient is hypoxic and this time i was almost out of all the options now, so with the third hypoxic episode uh, the only thing which uh, was left for me to do is to reflect on again from point a to point z i was bagging the patient the saturation were not really improving uh, and this time the patient's blood pressure started to drop which had always been very stable His blood pressure was now looking like uh, uh, from 100 systolic to about 90 to 80 to 70 systolic. And that, uh, that sort of put me in a mind frame that this is, this is bread stacking. Um, and reflecting onto that every time, which was, by the way, about three or four times, he would go hypoxic. It would be our natural instinct to disconnect him from the ventilator and bag him to achieve a normal oxygen is just we disconnected the ventilator from the patient the tube was sticking out with the viral filter on and we just put the pressure onto his chest and let all the air out which we may have built it and right before our eyes the patient's oxygen saturation improve jumping from 70s to 80s to 90s to 100 percent his blood pressure improved. He had an arterial line by that time, so we had an invasive blood pressure reading. His blood pressure improved from 70s to 80s to 90s to 120. So, so very quickly, what is breath stacking? Breath stacking is also called an autopeep or air trapping. So in asthmatic or COPD or emphysema patients, expiratory phase in breathing is too short. So they're naturally retaining air in the lung hence increasing the lung volume and increasing the peep which is called an auto peep they have got an inherently generated generated auto peep this leads to a hyperinflated or overinflation of lungs which leads to poor ventilation poor airflow poor circulation within the lung and hence leading to hypoxia the saturation would drop also because the lungs are hyperinflated it leads to poor venous return and leads to hypotension so very telltale signs hypotension hypoxia in asthmatics 
is due to auto peep uh, or best tracking until proven otherwise beautiful all his ops just completely normalized uh, without any further issue till he got retrieval team arriving when the retrieval team arrived uh, the retrieval consultant said to me oh i just would like to increase the peep a little bit i said don't you dare touch the ventilator this has taken a considerable amount of time and effort um, and you gotta you gotta not touch this ventilator because every time you take the peep up he'll start breath stacking and he'll become hypotensive and hypoxic so this is something which i would not recommend at any cost okay quickly let's just go through some key learning points always verbalize your plan a b and c for intubation make sure that your team is aware of that plan and understand that completely without any issues Make sure that you check all the re requested investigations after the intubation. For example, the chest X-ray and the CTPA that we did in this patient, and it really changed our management. In order to troubleshoot post-intubation hypoxia, use the mnemonic DOPS, which takes you through very common issues in a very systematic way. Beware when you move the patient from uh, the resuscitation trolley to the CT scan back from the CT scan to the resuscitation trolley. Sitting up and lying down, the tube may migrate and may create some other issues. It's also important to keep the family always involved in the decision-making process and kept, keep them up to date about how the patient's condition is progressing. If you're working in a small hospital, push for a transfer to intensive care unit via the retrieval services early. Some of the best learning comes out of the team debrief. So once you're done, uh, sit down with your team, think it over, what went good, what can be improved, so you can really consolidate your learning in that way. I wish you best of luck uh, through your work in emergency and hope you like the video. And uh, please, if you do like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Emergency Focus. and. Uh, um, you may have already subscribed to our Emergency Focus Facebook page. Uh, please comment if you've got anything else to comment. Obviously, no resuscitation is perfect. There's always room for improvement. There's always room for a better idea. Let me know your thoughts and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. Khuda Hafiz.